Hi, everybody, and welcome to this month's Brown Bag Lunch. I am Dia Nagaraj, the Albert Ravenholt Curator of Danish American Culture at the Museum of Danish America. This month, I am delighted to introduce Professor William White, who is at UC Berkeley, who will be talking to us today about collaborative archaeology on St. Croix. Before I turn it over to him, I would like to thank our sponsor for the speaker series, Dennis Anderson. Professor White's article in the upcoming issue of the America Letter is also supported by a grant from the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor White and let him talk about his area of specialty. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for that introduction. Can I, I can share screen, right? Yes. Okay, I have, I have some slides to show. No one wants to stare here and watch me talk. <laughs> At least that's what my students are. I can, you know, hopefully you will all stay awake, unlike the students I have here at UC Berkeley. Uh, thanks for that introduction. I, I'm absolutely overjoyed to be here today. Um, my name is Bill White, and I'm an assistant professor of anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley. I teach historical archaeology and African diaspora archaeology, but I also teach uh, heritage conservation and cultural resource management. So um, I'd like to spend the time here with you to make sure that I uh, tell you about a project that's really close to my own heart. And, uh, it's something I've been working on for several years now. And before I go any further, though, I want to acknowledge, you know, everybody, we're all coming from all these different parts of the world. And I appreciate everybody tuning in. The place where I'm at here in Hercules, California, is on ancestral land of the Oaloni people, who for thousands of years have been the stewards of this place, and they're a very active um, uh, um, creator and shaper of the San Francisco Bay Area. And you know, as someone who's living on um, the lands of another group of people, you know, that's part of a another group of people who is also far from my ancestral lands. You know, I just want to acknowledge that where I'm at and where many of us are at in the United States and, and elsewhere is on land that has been taken from folks. And so it's, it's kind of difficult to acknowledge that up front because, you know, where do we go with that, right? If we're living on someone else's land, but I feel like the first step towards uh, healing is recognizing that, you know, other people's past and other people's heritage is part of your present right now. And so just by thinking on that aspect, you know, that leads us into the talk that I want to give today. But I also hope that it uh, motivates people to start thinking a little bit more about the communities in which you live and you know where where the things that you have have come from. Uh, the talk that I want to give today uh, it's rooted in just ongoing um, you know ongoing process that's unfolding in the United States. I don't know how much folks know about archaeology in the United States, but the training of the next generation of archaeologists is taking place in this time of great change and, and transformation in, in the United States. Uh, and the work that we're doing is situated in that entire uh, endeavor of trying to, to increase diversity and trying to increase transparency and also acknowledge you know, those who came before us in a respectful way. And I think that that's really important because uh, no matter what your background is, if you're living in the United States, you know that you know we we're we're moving through a new a new time, right? Where folks are trying to um, find a new direction in this world that's changing rapidly. Where the things that we thought we knew for generations that we were told growing up, it's just slipping away, right? And one of the things that we can all draw inspiration on and, and stability from is our own ancestry and the people who came before us, and and having a better understanding of how. All of us have all lived together on this land for many years, right? And in the case of folks who are of uh, uh, African descent specifically, archaeology has been used to kind of minimize uh, Black history. But the new wave, the, the thing that uh, many archaeologists are trying to do is try to get um, uh, indigenous people, people of African descent, Asian Americans, Hispanic folks, uh, part of this entire process of creating our own history and our own identity and rewriting these pasts, right, as a form of reclaiming the past, but also regenerating ourselves and rejuvenating ourselves in the present, because we start changing the stories that have held us back, right, those stories that are at the heart of the structural inequality and the differences that we see exploited in our society today, this kind of uh, collaborative community-based stuff, 
where you've got many different people coming together from different backgrounds. This is the thing that uh, breaks down that inequality because as we're more familiar with each other, we know more about each other's heritage. We can find lines of similarity where there are other forces that are trying to create differences. Um, you know, I'm an archeologist. I've been an archeologist for about 20 years. And now I'm a professor who helps train the next generation of archeologists. And so, you know, this crazy uh, Venn diagram here is, is looking at many of the things that are going on when it comes to uh, archeology span and training students in universities today. And, you know, you probably have heard renditions of this in your newspaper and all over the press, depending on what, the, what, what folks wanted to say about, you know, what's going on in universities. But, you know, the social justice movement, when it comes to something like anthropology, which is the field that trains archeologists in the United States, is uh, really, um, it can't separate itself from the ongoing social justice movement that's constantly moving all around us all the time. And so, you know, all of us are part of this maelstrom, but when you're uh, um, a university professor or you're a student in the United States, all of these different things come kind of, you know, all together, right? The total economic change in the workplace realities that young people are facing in this world, that the people who work at universities are facing, right? The constant change in our technologies, the brilliant technologies that let me speak to you here are making entire things obsolete that once, you know, people were going to college to learn how to, you know, administer commercial real estate, that entire thing has changed because now we can do this. We don't have to actually go to work anymore. And that's just one example, right? Uh, in the United States, the incoming population of adults is smaller than previous generations. So universities are going to have, have faced a shortfall of just people who are eligible to go to school. We call that the enrollment gap, but also COVID has exacerbated that because a lot of folks didn't go to school and a lot of folks uh, didn't go to school, just public school. So now we may face a population of people who are uh, less able to get into universities, right? And then the students who are there are dissatisfied with the structures that are there, the, the, the economic structures, the cultural structures, the fact that they don't always learn what they need to go into the workplace, you know, and all of that stuff affects the funding of universities and their abilities to pull out, uh, fulfill their mission. As someone who trains archaeologists, you know, I'm very interested in getting folks ready to work. Uh, I went to college and that's I, all the things that I learned there are what helped me get into the field of archaeology and it's really helped me get to where I'm at. And so, you know, I'm always trying to figure out how can I better train students, right? And I work for a university that is recognizing that its existing system is really difficult to be supported. So, you know, with this entire thing changing, with it not meeting student needs or the needs of the workplace, you know, what does that mean for the way that I train students? In the United States, over 90%, I'd say probably like 95% based on whatever study you look like, look at 95% of the archeologists in the United States are of European descent. And there's been a long campaign to try to increase the presence of people of color in archeology. span And so, you know, given its history of using human remains and not being inclusive of non-white communities, how can we convince students of color to do archeology span when, you know, maybe they, their communities have been harmed by it? And then of course, as someone who's working in this entire system, what role is archeology span gonna play in the social justice movement? And you may think that it doesn't necessarily have any kind of role, but the work that I'm talking about, about being inclusive and giving communities voice can just as easily be co-opted by people who want to pursue uh, division, supremacy and other things because they can take archeological data and spin it that way to, to get their platform, right? So what role will the work that I do and others of my generation do? What, what, how is that gonna inform the societies in which we live? So I start off with all that stuff because I'm gonna tell you about how I teach field school in the US Virgin Islands. And the goal of that is to get people the skills they need to work in archeology span while also doing justice for the community in which the work is being conducted. But there's no way I can separate myself from all these realities that are going on all around me. Okay, I'll, I'll talk right away about the um, project that I'm doing that's on the island of St. Croix in the US Virgin Islands. And you know, I, I introduce it as us trying to um, connect with the place and the heritage and the community, the work that's already going on. And as archeologists, we just add our perspective to a, a homegrown effort that's been going on for longer than I've even been alive on the Virgin Island and in St. Croix. For folks who don't know, St. Croix 
there's a um, island in the Caribbean that's east of Puerto Rico. Right now, it is part of the um, territory of the U.S. Virgin Islands that has three main islands, St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John. And those three islands were formerly the Danish West Indies. But before the Denmark purchased the islands from France, it was a contested space where um, indigenous island, uh, different tribes and different groups had lived for thousands of years. And they, you know, uh, in the 1490s and 1500s ran headlong into ambitions of Spain and other European nations. And in that entire change, you know, there was this uh, uh, violent transformation where uh, um, genocide and um, death from disease, along with battles between different colonial powers and their native allies and uh, opponents, all of this stuff took place to the point where uh, the indigenous presence on St. Croix was greatly diminished. By the 16th century or by the 1600s, uh, there were uh, agricultural plantations um, that were on St. Croix, but it was a contested place where French and Dutch planters were running these plantations and these operations. And at a very early time, we see in people, enslaved Africans working on these different plantations. For years, Spain tried to oust these different uh, non-Spanish entities from the islands. But at a certain point, it was really, it fell to the uh, French monarchy, which then was transferred to Denmark as Denmark aspired to have more call colonies around the world to provide these kind of goods, but also to create the revenue that comes from this slave-based plantation economy. For years, it was a place where enslaved people of African descent, enslaved folks, and free people of African descent all lived together in a space that was primarily people of African descent until 1917 when it was purchased by the United States. Uh, sugar had dominated the economy till the 20th century when the United States got there, but as I'll explain, competition made it so that these were no longer profitable. The United States uses and still continues to use St. Croix specifically as a strategic location for a petroleum refining and it's a strategic asset for the United States. But at the end of the day, through this entire process, the uh, formerly indigenous island of St. Croix has become an African place where people of African descent provide the vast majority of the population there in the Virgin Islands. Okay, so uh, here is an overview from Google Earth of the island of St. Croix. And you can see the dot there where our project area, the estate Little Princess is located. It's just to the Northwest of the town of Christiansted. There's two main towns on uh, the Virgin Islands, uh, Christiansted and Frederickstead. And uh, um, the place that I'm talking about is just outside the boundaries of Christiansted. Now, some of this is, is um, uh, we're kind of, we're, we're some of the first people to do archaeology on the state little princess. So we don't necessarily have all these connections of all these different archaeological cultures on this one property. But when we took a look at the island of St. Croix, for about 5,000 years, it was a, a native place where there were different archaeological cultures of, of um, uh, uh, Carib and Arawak groups who were moving across time to this island. St. Croix itself has um, always been kind of one of the lesser islands because of its close proximity to um, uh, Puerto Rico. And there were other islands who had more water resources and other things. So uh, St. Croix never really had extremely large villages to, before the um, arrival of uh, Columbus. In 1493, one of Columbus's voyages uh, lands on the island of St. Croix. And the Spanish claim this island, but like I said, for years, it was difficult for them to actually administer it and to keep other uh, colonial powers from going there. The English were among the first, the French, and there were Dutch folks who were in there too. And so these different um, nation states and kingdoms are vying back and forth for control of this island until 1733 when Denmark purchases it from the French who were able to exert their claim over the island. Uh, from 1733 until 1848, it was a place where enslaved slavery was legal and enslaved Africans uh, worked places like the estate Little Princess. And so slavery was there before the Danish crown took over, but it was inflamed and expanded greatly during the time period where Denmark used it as one of its main colonies. In 1848, uh, Denmark decides that the, the, it was uh, you know, difficult for the crude economic reasons of keeping human beings alive and working them the way that they did. 
to maintain slavery and they switched over to a wage contract system. And by the late 1800s, people of African descent were joined with people of East Indian descent as the laborers on many of these different plantations. So the place that I'm talking about, Estate Little Princess, was um, first purchased by Peter von Scholten and another partner. And it was in the von Scholten family all the way till 1878 when uh, Emil Schweitzer took over and it was managed as a sugar producing property for all that time. However, the nature of producing sugar changed over time. In the beginning, it was enslaved Africans who were doing the work, then contract laborers. And then by the 1900s, it was just difficult for them to make money on uh, this plantation, which, you know, one of our things that we're looking into is the degradation of the soils and the transformation of the landscape. It was just difficult to make money. And so at that point, it uh, went out of sugar production. But the housing that was used for the enslaved people was occupied all the way till the 1980s. So these slave cabins that were enslaved persons cabins that were created in the 19th century were used all the way into the 1980s to house people on St. Croix. This is a photo, uh, an overview of the place where we're working. And there's uh, a lot of different things going on here. It's difficult to tell from this picture. But the place where we're doing most of our research is where historical maps show that there was a village where people of African descent lived as enslaved people first, and then later as uh, contract workers. Our excavations really, the, the, what you would think of as traditional archeological excavations, they center on this location where there are some extant cabin ruins. And so we found uh, a row of cabin remains. And like I said, many of those were still used as rental properties all the way into the 1980s. But we're, we're searching through the, this, um, uh, this landscape that's it's administered by the Nature Conservancy right now and kept as a nature preserve. So it's you know, heavily forested and we're looking through that area to try and find the remains of the remainder of those cabins. But this entire landscape was oriented toward sugar production since its conception. Uh, one of the things that uh, happened during the 19th century before emancipation uh, Denmark issued an edict that uh, persons who owned slaves had to provide for them, provide medical care. And that's been one of the things that, you know, uh, in history books that have been called out as, you know, a benevolent thing of, of Danish uh, slave owners that they were actually taking care of their slaves. But the reality was they were working human beings so hard that they died faster than they could actually infect enslave more individuals to ship to the island. And so uh, they converted this warehouse that's one of the earliest buildings on the property into what they call a hospital. But what it was is slaves would give, provide rest and other um, herbal remedies mainly to people who were getting worked to death and had disease were malnourished until they could be sent back out there to be worked again. So this is one of the um, historic properties that is uh, still on the property that Folks, if you go there, you'll be able to see that there. Now, the, the heart of the, the entire process was this location where the uh, sugar factory was located. And the entire process is growing sugar, which is a form of grass into um, uh, maturity and then crushing that, the stalk of that grass and boiling it down from juice till it crystallizes into rough sugar and then processed even further, right? From this turbinado sugar crystallized formation into uh, you know the what refined white sugar that we know today. So this was the location, the, the, the um, ruins of that um, was how they crushed the grass, got the juice and um, crystallized it into sugar. And it went through several different renditions from uh, powered early on by uh, cane stalks and wood, but then later on by uh, coal. And then after a while, they realized that it wasn't even efficient. They started to send the cane to central production locations on the island. Now the process of crushing that cane stalk into juice happened here at the windmill. So um, early on, it was a wind powered mill. Then, like I said, later on, it was uh, mechanized. But during the time when they were an enslaved people, this was the place where the cane stalks were crushed and then the juice conveyed over to the factory where it was boiled down. One of the things that we've really started looking into more is water on the island. So um, St. Croix is, is a subtropical, semi-tropical island in that it doesn't rise high enough in elevation to catch those higher level air currents that would cause water to condense in rainfall. Now, many of the Caribbean islands 
they get plenty of rainfall. And so it's lush vegetation. And some of them, they're trying to convey water away from the fields where uh, the sugar's being cultivated. Sugar is the kind of crop that needs water pretty consistently. Too much water at certain times in its life cycle, that can cause problems. But definitely too little water will create cane that doesn't have enough sugar in it to be economically viable. So on the property, we've noticed several different locations where there were wells and reservoirs and retention ponds designed to capture water that, so that it could, could be conveyed to the fields. Now, the big house is the main thing that when people go to this location, they show up there. But early on, this was one of the Von Schulten's many properties on the island. And it's unlikely that they spent very much time on this property that they owned themselves and operated as a plantation. So the big house for uh, um, many years wasn't actually the main property or main dwelling for the, the plantation owner. During the contract worker period, they did actually occupy this property and they lived there. However, a lot of times when you go to this place, that's where the tour really is facing. So, you know, you've got this whole diverse landscape. Most of the interest is going towards this hospital and the main house that gives people a whole different understanding of what it was like to be there. And there's very little conversation about what it was like to be an enslaved person on this plantation, even though most of the people who lived there were actually enslaved African people. Now, one of the things that we do here is uh, we like to model our um, the different buildings on the property. And we also create 3D models of our excavation units. And so uh, this is an example of the remains that uh, the remains of a cabin that would have been used by enslaved people on this property. Now, this is of course like the last occupied one. So it's in the best shape of all the others. Uh, but this thing, which measures about um, 30 feet wide, 30 feet long by about you know 15, 18 feet wide would have been a duplex that would have housed two enslaved people or contract workers' families. And so the number of people who were living in these kind of buildings changes over time. We have maps that show after emancipation, there was up to 38 houses, but we don't know um, what the orientation of those original buildings was, and we don't know exactly how many people were living there. But we know that the number of people who are living and working there only increases over time. And during the uh, period of enslavement, there's a couple dozen individuals that show up on these uh, rosters, sometimes more, sometimes less. Um, but it really expands during the contract worker time period where folks are renting out these and they're still working this plantation. But we do know that there's a significant number of people in the 200 years that this was a sugar property that lived and many died here on this plantation. So the life of living there on this thing as an enslaved person or a contract worker, but definitely during the enslaved time period was work all day and all night under brutal conditions when it was time to harvest the cane and then work all day when it wasn't time to harvest cane. So the just the intense labor that happens during the harvest time period in these kind of dangerous conditions, right? Not only the labor of working under the sun to cut cane and crush it into uh, juice or convey it to the, the crusher, but also working in the uh, factory, which was you know, thousands of degrees. Um, it led to injury and death pretty frequently. You know, mortality was very high here on the, on the plantation. And the sad thing is this particular property was never extremely profitable as a sugar production unit. And throughout its entire history, the people who owned it were constantly trying to find ways to make it productive so that it could actually uh, break even or uh, make a profit. And so what the saddest aspect is human lives are being ground up literally for this sugar in a situation where the people who own it can barely even keep it afloat. And uh, you know, improving technology over time wasn't enough to, con uh, to compensate for what was going on. And after a couple hundred years of trying this, folks finally gave up on producing sugar. And, and you know, one of the things that if, if we're moving into this world where we're trying to understand the legacy of other people, you know, you know, what happens to a society when we use humans this way? This is one of my uh, questions that I have for my own research. What happens to, um, you know, the people who are in Denmark who are um, supporting this entire system, the people who are there actually enslaving and using violence and coercion to force humans to do that. And then definitely what is happening to, uh, the people of African descent after they undergo that for multiple generations. And then with all that kind of impact, such heavy impact on someone's uh, life and what they know about the past, is there any way that you can get some uh, restorative justice or some kind of constellation out of consolation 
out of working at a place like this. So that brings us to the next part where, you know, we connect into what, what can this, what kind of stories can we generate from this that can give people the motivation to move further. And in this next part, you know, I'm talking more about what us as project directors and members are doing to try and use this as restorative and regenerative uh, justice for the people who live there and all of the people who hear about this place. Now, our project, like I said, it just joins a host of ongoing activities that folks who live on the island, people of African descent that live there, things that they've already been doing for generations to reclaim their own history. Uh, so, you know, it looks like this is a neat five part division, but in, in reality, this is really a constellation of things like a kaleidoscope that's constantly changing all the time. And archaeology is just one small piece of that, right? And, you know, it kind of goes from these formal organizations like uh, the Nature Conservancy that's been gracious enough to let us do work out there and permit our work. They're also the ones who administer the property. So they want to learn more about this property they own an archaeological site. And so to better manage that thing and also to, you know, make this an asset for people who visit, they are taking a, 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 um, a active interest in our activities there. But we've also got, you know, organizations like the State Historic Preservation Office of the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's a territory, which means that properties that have historic or um, parcels that have historic properties like the Estate Little Princess, the um, U.S. Virgin Islands Territorial Preservation Office is interested in the maintenance and the, the recordation of those properties. So there's these, you know, really structured organizations, the Slave Rex Projects, the Smithsonian also provides uh, guidance and um, uh, funding. Those mix with other organizations on the island like Frondel Girard's uh, group, Crucian Heritage and Nature Tourism, that is a grassroots afro uh heritage conservation thing that had been going on long before there was archeology span there. A colleague, Chinazira Davis Kaina at the University of Virgin Islands teaching black students and realizing the power of incorporating archeology span into the history studies there. And also the Caribbean Museum and Center for, for the Arts providing space for us to give these talks, but also inviting artists who are you know, doing this kind of applied work of African heritage and sending this information out to the world through their art. There's a list of scholars, I've just listed folks here, but the majority of the people who are working on island on the, the archeological team there in place are of African descent. We're professors at universities on the mainland. We're joined by uh, graduate students, uh, white, black, other graduate students who are seeing this entire thing unfold. And then we've most recently started connections with some scholars in Denmark, trying to get them to come out to the field and also learn more about their projects that they have going on in the Danish West Indies. Of course, the people who are the future of St. Croix are the, the youth. So finding a way to connect them with uh, archaeology and to show them, you know, there's uh, these scholars of African descent that are all throughout your country and that there's students of African descent who are going to school and to go on to college. And it's actually worth it to be part of this kind of stuff. But also it's worth it to learn how archaeology can contribute to your understanding of the path. So past. So we have that involved too. And then none of it would really be possible without the people of the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands and uh, St. Croix, those folks who care about heritage and those have cultural knowledge to give us information that you can't get from any kind of book or from an archaeological site. One of the main things, like I said before, is our youth program that's oriented towards afro crucian students there on the island. Uh, we uh, have a project where we have a, um, uh, like a, a field study where students come that are in middle school and high school, they work with us in the field for a week, but for another week, they learn all about historical archeology span and a lot of the historic properties on the island. It's in um, uh, adherence with the curriculum standards there for education. And it also builds on those uh, organic heritage initiatives that folks are already doing on island. So they come for a week and dig with us in the sun, but they really are part of a much larger, um, a much larger system of heritage conservation that's coming from people that are there. The other thing that we have is uh, we invite students from historically black colleges and universities through the University of California's HBCU initiative to come and learn archeological field methods with us. And so the program that we have gives a summer stipend for 
students from HBCUs to learn archaeological method and theory in the field with us, to learn about you know African diasporic history at St. Croix, and also to um, uh, have a space where they're only with all Black scholars learning about Black history in a Black community. So it's a really unique situation for archaeology students. It's something I never even dreamed could be possible in the United States. Um, but as if they're accept as they are accepted and complete the program, they also get some uh, some preferences for um, applying to University of California uh, institutions for graduate school. So they don't have to go into archaeology. We want them to go into it, but if they want to go into almost any degree field and they get accepted to one of the University of Californias, uh, they get their um, applications waived and then they get some funding from the University of California system because the effort is to bring many of these African American students from the East to these UCs here in California. So if you're out there with us and you're one of these students, your life is shaped by <laughs> going to the site, rain or shine, and uh, digging in the sun with me at these different locations. And in the process, you're gonna learn um, current archeological method and theory. The goal is for folks to finish the program and be able to apply to a company or the forest service and become an archeologist from this field school. So when you're out there with us, you're learning what it takes to become a young archeologist in the United States. And like I said before, there's a lack of people of color in archeology. span So you know, these folks are feeling a need in the actual field of archeology, span a different perspective. And like I said, being out there is a very unique situation. You're working on these enslaved cabins, but you're doing all the stuff that you would at an archeological field school. And these students are coming from universities that don't have archeology span programs. They don't have any archeologists, most of them, these small black colleges, but they're also working with scholars who are you know, really giving talks like this and connecting in a lot of different ways. And in the process, we're collecting data on the life of enslaved people on St. Croix, which is something that you know, we really don't have a lot of information on from history books. But then the other thing that's happening is students and scholars and everyone who's part of it are being immersed in, like I said, these organic heritage conservation activities. And this is a picture of a day trip for youth to this location called Maroon Ridge, which was a location where escaped enslaved Africans went. It was a rugged location. It was difficult for anyone to come and get them. And so they stayed on this remote location, but it's also, as we're learning, on the routes to different currents that would have led them to Puerto Rico where they could escape to freedom. And um, you know, if you go on the tour, you'll listen to black elders, Afro-Crucian folks talk about the landscape, how we use the land, how um, people of African descent used plants and medicinal herbs that were nearby and how they use landscape features to maintain their concealment, but also how they could pay attention to the ocean currents that change over the time to where they could body float or swim all the way to Puerto Rico and swim to freedom. So as I come into the conclusion here, you know, uh, that structural inequality that I was talking about that's at the heart of how we have these differences in the United States. Immersing yourself in this kind of history and learning about this stuff, listening while you and doing at, as you're invited to do is one of those things that, you know, we don't really have a lot of opportunities for that. There's fewer and fewer opportunities for us to cross these boundaries and to connect with each other as citizens, as human beings, and to learn and listen about each other. And so this stuff is all rooted in, you know, uh, African diasporic logic and sensibility and information. And it's it's doing what it can to fill that void, right? To try and create that space for regeneration and rejuvenation. And it all, oops, and it requires, you know, us to uh, follow some, some, some rules and guidelines. And, and as I was thinking about this talk, I found this rules for restorative justice. And they were things that we already were doing that I didn't even actually know until I put this slide in here. That we were working uh, in collaboration and consultation with people who live there, not doing any more than we're asked, and then being very clear on what we can do as archaeologists, right? And also working towards healing. There's so much of the past that's been obscured and taken and concealed from people of African descent on St. Croix, that this is one way that we can actually try to reveal some of those stories so that folks can confront these things that once happened. Trying to make people accountable for the past, right? It's, it, you know, it, this is one of the things that the collaboration with scholars all around the world, right? Being accountable for what our work does and what happens as an archeologist as you extract information, but don't necessarily give back to the community, you know, what ends up happening. We're trying to strengthen the community and rebuild things 
by participating, by being partners as best as possible, the best way that we know how, and trying to make a contribution so that people have the strength to think of their ancestors and move down as things change in the future. What's next for us? Okay, so uh, COVID stopped us for a couple of years, but we, we made it through and um, we're headed back this next summer for a shortened field season. We're gonna bring four to five undergrad students this year. We've also got a group of graduate students who are gonna work with us out there. We'll be at the Estate Little Princess. And so we'll continue those excavations, but with more of an eye to environmental sampling and um, more detailed excavations uh, near those enslaved persons uh, cabins. During the pandemic, the way that we kept each other in the loop was by connecting with scholars in Denmark and across the United States and in the Caribbean to create what's kind of been informally called the Danish West Indies Collective. So there's folks from the Danish National Museum and Archive, folks from Aarhus University, University of Copenhagen, that are doing great projects on the Danish West Indies. And, you know, they're finding a lot of information, but not necessarily doing archaeology. So we're sharing what we learn. They're sharing what they learn. And the hope is that we can have folks from Denmark come with us to St. Croix and see what's going on and get a different perspective to archaeology. Uh, going forward, we still have funding. We have an invitation to go to Estate St. George, which is a botanical garden. It's also on St. Croix and to look at the soils in, in the different context of a much larger plantation in a different space that had more access to water. So it was a more viable plantation to try and evaluate what was happening on this bigger location. So those are three things that we're gonna continue doing into the future. And if you wanna know more about the project, it's increasingly getting covered on a lot of different media. The Hulu show, Your Attention Please, season two, they cover part of what we're doing there on the island. So check it out if you, you know, if you've got access to the internet, you're a YouTube fan like me, go ahead and check that out. And also a lot of other um, organizations like National Geographic and Science Magazine have done documentaries on our work there too. So you'll be able to see us in action and see more about like what we're doing there and more about the site itself. Okay, I think I did my best to stay on time. I appreciate everyone here for sticking around to the end of my talk. Uh, thank you very much for having me today. And uh, I'm open to any questions that folks have. Thank you so much, Bill. That was really fascinating. And I know I I was thinking halfway through that. I'm like, oh, kind of wish I'd done more archaeology in undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you did, too. We wish you did. I wish everybody did archaeology. Um, so yeah, as he said, um, you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question directly, or you're also welcome to pop a question in the chat as well. Um, I'd like to start off with a question that I had. Um, I know in a separate interview, you mentioned reading histories of the Crucians that didn't really reflect what you were hearing from them yourself. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that discrepancy. Um, yeah, I mean, yes. So, you know, I'll, I'll approach it from two different ways. You know, as someone of African descent, there's history. That's what you learn at school and is in a book. And then there's actual black history. And that actual black history is what really happened uh, to black folks. Um, and, you know, it's interpreted through a black lens, right? So there's more than one way to look at events in the past. Every single one of us looks at, you know, the things that are going on right now even this talk, and in our minds, we're creating an understanding of it, right? And so all of you listening to this could distill this down and write an article about it. And then everyone in this room could look at that article and say, hmm, that sounds like, you know, okay, that's probably a close accounting. And then there's some of us here that would be like, yeah, right, he didn't say that. And that's not really what happened. And I didn't take it that way, right? And so as someone, you know, African-American, we've long known that our history is not in a book. It's in the landscape, it's in our family, it's in our um, you know, stories that we tell about the past, it's in the skeletons that are in the ground and our people, right? So that a lot of times doesn't get into the books. And so that's you know, what we're learning, right? There's also you know, things that we're not meant to know, things that are you know, personal family history, things that are things that are shrouded in the past and don't ever get out and that they might be leaked out, but we, you know, we'll never know. And those things still influence the way that folks uh, the way that folks interpret uh, the past. And then there's also the reality of historians looking at records, right? Who writes the records? Uh, where, who's keeping the records? Who's cataloging them? And what terms are they using to catalog those records? 
that all influences the kind of history that's created that's not always reflected in the artifacts and then the features and then the stuff that we find at an archaeological site. So that's what I mean, like there's discrepancies. And the hope is that everyone would be okay with more than one different interpretation of the past unless the past is being weaponized to harm others. Uh, question, uh, do any of the uh, African from the dispor from the slave trade um, bring with them any uh, musical or particularly spiritual practices that have endured in the present uh, society? Yes. Like? There's all kinds of practices that are held out there. There are, are spiritual practices, right? I'm not Crucian, and so, you know, they're not, they're not always mine, right? But there are practices. Thank you. I have a couple questions. Thank you very much. I, that was really informative and powerful. Um, so what's the current population of St. Croix? Ooh, you know, I want, I want to say it's about, I want to say it's about 100,000, 105,000, I think. Okay. You can look on Wikipedia, you know, yeah. it'll show the most recent Good census idea. record. Yeah, the sorry, question, I don't have that off the top of my head. Okay. The other question, I was thinking of those indigenous people who were there probably at the time the Spaniards arrived, and were they driven out or did they die of disease? Yeah, you know, uh, so I can speak archaeologically and then I can speak about like what I've heard from folks. Um, like archaeologically, you see these uh, villages, some of them are in national parks and then others were kind of excavated at the turn of the century by antiquarians across the island. And, uh, you know, we see these different cultural ceramics and other uh, projectile points that are associated with these archaeological cultures. Um, but like, you don't really see these massive, you know, uh, like, you know, in the United States, there's places like Cahokia and other, you know, huge, huge native villages, right? That had tens of thousands of people. Uh, you don't really see that kind of thing on St. Croix because it is that kind of, it, it doesn't have very many rivers. They're mainly just streams. And, you know, it doesn't have very many lakes until later on when they start digging these uh, uh, um, um, things to capture water. So uh, archaeologically, we see people kind of coming and going, right? Probably moving seasonally and then maybe in, in good years staying all year, right? Uh, but then, like, that just kind of gets um, a layer of modern colonial stuff on top of it. And so the, it's just like, you know, in the United States, everywhere where we have major cities, there probably was a totally huge Native American village, but we just built our city on top of it. And it's probably similar to uh, the Virgin Islands, right? So we don't always find the remains of the Native folks. Mm -hmm. Now, what people say is that the Native folks are still there. They just were um, incorporated in the people who live there. So mm -hmm. those who didn't die found a way to adjust to living in the Caribbean by you know, um, mixing with people of European descent or African descent or mixing with other okay. tribes, like they would have been recognized separately. And so mm -hmm. when you talk to folks who uh, are of African descent, they say, well, you know, a part of my ancestry is native and therefore the natives aren't dead. And, you know, part of these other folks who are white or Hispanic or Puerto Rican, are they, are, they understand they're part indigenous and that it's just, they're not dead. So okay. they never died. They just become part of us who we are. Sure. And, you know, for many of us in the United States, that ends up being the reality of our lives too, right? Whether yeah. you're white or Hispanic, you may have some ancestry that's native. Yeah. Thank you. Now, of, of course, like the one thing I want to say right now is we're recording. That is a whole different thing than being a recognized native tribal member. We don't all get to just walk around with our 21 and me DNA thing and be like, yeah, you know what? I'm part Indian. That means therefore I'm Indian. No, that's not the same thing as being actual Native American with deep ancestry and connection to the land that is an accepted member of a Native American group and is recognized as Native American. Mm -hmm. We had a question in the chat um, and Tina wanted to know 
what is the protocol with regard to skeletons in the ground at Estate Little Princess or elsewhere on the island? Sure, I'm glad you, you said that. So the myself, the Society of Black Archaeologists, our protocol is avoid places that are marked as burials. Don't disturb people's ancestors. In the event that we would find ancestral remains, we would just treat them with respect as to whatever religious belief we you know, feel. If we, you know, if we found out that it was somehow a Christian burial in some way, whatever, you know, Christian groups are willing to come and bless this burial, right? We would just avoid. Once again, we're working at conservancies. So we're trying to conserve the resources. If we find things like that, we're just going to leave them there. We're not going to uh, keep them there. So we keep our stuff away from where they say there was the cemetery. Uh, in practice on Caribbean islands, they there's tens of thousands of people who lived on these islands and died on these islands, and there's not very much soil. So skeletons are all over the place. And, you know, unfortunately, folks do things like remodel their houses and find burials. And, you know, uh, it, it's up to the property owner a lot of times to end up doing that, right? So in the United States, the way that our our laws go, you know, if you find it human remains on your property, the first thing is to contact the sheriff or the police to find out whether that was a crime victim, right? If it's a modern, we want to solve crime. So that would be the first step. Then after that, if it's an archaeological burial, um, you know, it goes into the domain of archaeology. And if you're not working on a project that has a connection to a state, territorial, or federal law that requires you to do archaeology, then it's up to you to decide what you respectfully would do with your own artifacts in the United States, like in a place like I live in California or Iowa or elsewhere. If you have private property and you have an archaeological site on your land um, and you're not doing anything that requires a legal nexus that would require you to do archaeology, those remains, except for human remains and Native American burials, are yours to do whatever you want with. But when it comes to human remains, they fall in an in-between state. If it's connected to Native American tribe, there's something called the uh, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. And you're supposed to repatriate those to Native people. But if you find people of European descent or African descent, then it's like up to your own county or community what the rules are, right? And on the Virgin Islands, they kind of hand them over to the archaeologists that are there. And then those kind of end up going in repositories as artifacts rather than reburied if they're not native burials, right? So that's the that's the like complicated complication. So there's a lot of museums that have human remains that are coming from people's properties because the people just don't know what to do. And there's not funding really to bury them in a cemetery. And also we wouldn't know what religious practices a lot of times to bury folks. So, you know, how responsible is it really to, to just guess, right? So they kind of end up archaeological samples. Um, and there was a follow-up question to that, which was, would you attempt to check DNA to know who they were? Yeah, you know, that's a great, great question. And, you know, um, uh, for us at the SBA, we probably would have a long conversation with the Nature Conservancy and request that we just bury them in place and put the remains back and stop digging near that and just go away from human remains. Um, if you were a property owner and you find a human and you're not sure if it's a Native American burial or, you know, the, the state has decided it's not a Native American burial, then it's really you can decide if you want to figure out um, maybe what ancestry, but we're Americans, right? So, you know, you probably have some pretty mixed up ancestry. And so then what, what would you do, right? If you realize that you have, you know, some, a, a human that has like 30% Irish, 25%, um, you know, Spanish, 12% uh, Danish, right? Like, wh wh what would you do with a person like that, right? That would be the question after that. So if we at the SBA, we wouldn't do DNA analysis. We would just try to put that person back and just, I guess, whatever ceremonies we could get from religious leaders, have them hopefully bless that individual that we haven't ruined their eternity by digging them up. One thing that I'm curious about is what has been the most rewarding part of working um, on a state little princess and being mm -hmm. part of this fieldwork school for you personally? Yeah, you know, that's a great question too. Um, 
you know, for me, it's just, well, I'm gonna, I, like, I was like born for this, right? So archaeology site <laughs> in me is, is like a perfect companion. That's what I want to do all the time. So all of the archaeology is all good for me. But for me, it's like students who have never, like students who don't go to schools where they have this kind of black history, then being on an island where that's the normal history, right? So like the things that you thought that your parents were crazy for telling you being vindicated as like, no, that's just us. That, that's what's going on, right? So, uh, you know, I think that that revelation that it doesn't have to be the way it is on the mainland for these black students, like that I think is the most rewarding thing. Um, we had another question um, and Jerry was wondering what types of artifacts have you found? On the yeah, I'm glad, site. I'm glad you asked that because there's a lot of really interesting stuff. Uh, so like I was mentioning, the estate little princess has gone through renditions for hundreds of years, right? So um, in the early times before we really have maps, we know the first group of um, enslaved Africans were kind of like left to do many of the practices that they had back, you know, in the different countries and cultures where they come from. And so uh, we see like a um, like a, a way that the enslaved person's villages is really fashioned along the lines of African um, cities, right? So, you know, you're getting people who are coming from many different countries in West Africa and around Africa that a lot of times are going to other Caribbean islands and creating, you know, new cultural variant there before they are, you know, uh, purchased and then sent to St. Croix. So you've got a mixture of folks who are from the Caribbean, born in the new world, that have been learning languages, different European languages, mixing different African languages and spiritual practices and cultures, and then folks coming straight from Africa as well. And so what you see is kind of a different way that the, the village is laid out. And during that early time, what we're looking for is like, you know, um, the, the, the buildings that they had were round in shape and they were oriented kind of in like circular fashion with a central courtyard. Um, with uh, a lot of um, afro crusian ceramics. So there were these different kinds of ceramic practices of people of West African descent are making these different kinds of vessels. The body of those is different. I can actually show you um, a picture of one of those uh, afro crusian ceramic fragments that we find there. And so there's some parts where that's the only kind of uh, ceramic, like certain layers, archeological layers, you can see right here in the left, that's a piece of afro uh ceramic. And so when we get to those layers that only have that and don't have any European metal or other ceramics, then we know that that's you know, giving us ideas of the very earliest times of what's going on on Estate Little Princess. At a certain point in the early 19th century, uh, the D Danish crown tells uh, people who own slaves to orient their, they believe that that you know, African um, orientation, first of all, breeds more resistance and more, um, you know, community amongst people of African descent, but also that they were saying that that might be unhealthy for them to live in houses like that. So you start to see the row pattern, and that's when you start to see those stone and um, masonry buildings, like the duplex that I showed you there, they're all oriented in a grid pattern, and then they have like a rectangular shape of the village. And so the orientation of where activities are taking place outside the house is different. And at that time period, you also see a lot more European ceramics because, you know, they're really keyed into these different European trade networks. And, you know, folks who are enslaved are still buying the things that they like from the world. So they're getting buttons and beads and they're getting, you know, uh, ceramics and all this other stuff, because even though they're working very hard, they also have agency to purchase the things that they like. And then in those archaeological layers, you start to see different kinds of material. You still see those afro crusian and, and uh, African ceramics there, but that's mixed with, you know, things from England and, and uh, the Netherlands and some Danish things too. So, you know, those kind of things give us ideas of like what's, what's going on there. And then of course, during the 20th century, you start to see all the modern stuff that we have, right? Like Coca-Cola bottles and other stuff, because once again, people are living there for, you know, decades and so we start to see more modern things pieces of plastic and other stuff too i think we have time for one or two more questions if anybody has any um i know one thing that 
I was curious about is what is kind of governmental support like? Um, I know you mentioned that you're getting support from a lot of local people, but um, have you found the US government or local government or even the Danish government have been particularly mm -hmm. invested? Yeah, you know, that's that's interesting too. So like um, the Estate Little Princess is on the National Register of Historic Places as a historic property that is a list of um, significant historic properties across the United States. And as a US territory, all his significant historic properties on in the Virgin Islands, they also qualify for the National Historic Preservation Act. Uh, but the Nature Conservancy is a nonprofit entity that is, you know, I think it's funded mostly from donations at this point and also revenue generated by its properties and, and tourism and stuff. So um, our work there is really trying to be as light on the land as possible because it, it, an archaeological site is an invaluable resource that the more digging you do in it, the more you're destroying it and you can't ever put it back together. So we always want to be mindful of like just doing a, a small amount of small excavations rather than, you know, ripping off the entire top with machines and stuff. So um, our, we don't need as much support necessarily as like a big construction project. But when it comes to the government, it's really, you know, they're permitting to allow us as professional archaeologists to excavate. Um, we don't get any money from the government. And, uh, you know, we haven't applied for any money from the uh, Danish government. I have gotten some grants to go and collaborate and um, connect with scholars in Denmark. Uh, but that wasn't to do archaeology, even though they have grants to come to St. Croix and do archaeology, right? So the key is to try and work together so that all of our information is going together so that we're all learning from each other and at the same time uh, rather than having a bunch of small projects that don't always connect right we'll learn more that way but the federal government is a huge sponsor of archaeology in the united states just not our project the federal government pays for archaeology when it has to when it's legally required i i think that's everything um but thank you so much and are there any last words you'd like to leave us with this afternoon well uh the one thing i'd like to say is uh you know check out history on your own and if you're reading it from a book that ain't the real history so go to communities and talk to folks you know you live in this wide world and uh talk to your neighbors and talk to people about what happened in the past and go to different neighborhoods and stuff like that and, and get out there once we once we can take masks off and stuff, you know, smile at other people and, and just start listening, right? And you're gonna hear these amazing stories that you never even knew existed. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us today. I think this was really fascinating and a wonderful introduction to the world of archeology span on St. Croix and how archeology span can be a tool for social justice and social change. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for joining us this Tuesday. Well, that was that was fascinating. Well, I hope so. I hope that you still got lunch in. I don't want you to starve. No site is worth starving for. I can tell you that. Oh. It. One thing I was curious: is there still kind of remnants of Danish culture, obviously, in the built world? But is there still a cultural element of Denmark that persists in the in St. Croix today? Well, I mean, uh, uh, the, from the Crucian perspective, those buildings that are supposed to be in uh, Danish fashion were not built by people from Denmark. It was enslaved individuals who actually did the construction, including cutting the coral blocks and doing all that other stuff. Those are folks who learned about this kind of architecture from living on in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So you don't like the buildings that you see there. I never saw anything uh, that was similar to the 18th century um, construction types there on St. Croix when I was in Denmark. I never saw anything like that. Folks at that time period in Denmark are building completely different buildings because their environment is completely different. And the needs of the structural needs of those buildings was different. So I'm still trying to put together where the Danish elements connect. To me, it seems like it's a Caribbean kind of kind of structure, construction, you know, um, but 
the other thing about the the Danish culture, I mean, it just depends on who you ask, right? So um, some folks will claim Danish heritage that are living in the um, the Virgin Islands and stuff. But of course, that means that they were the slave owners, right? Even whether they were or not. And that matters a lot if you're white in a community where most of the people used to be the slaves. But there's also, you know, the whole thing of uh, Danish tourists, right? So that's a whole nother aspect of the way it's advertised to sail the seven seas and see the, you know, um, the Pirates of the Caribbean style heritage of Denmark and to go to the islands and to be in the tropical paradise where there was slavery, but there's paradise today and the, the people in, in the Virgin Islands are welcoming, right? So there's a huge tourism industry that's, you know, plays on these kind of, I don't know what to say about it, right? It's like this kind of interpretation of the past that Denmark was like not really a slave country and that it never really did slavery. And that the reason why the Virgin Islands are the way they are is because of the United States, because they're African-Americans and we're the ones who are harming them. So there's that whole thing. And the scholars I work with are like spending their careers trying to combat that. They're trying to confront it through art exhibits and articles and presentations and archaeology and all this stuff. They're trying to to do all this stuff. And then, you know, uh, there's many people who say, well, this kind of history is taught in public school in Denmark. And I learned all about this. And then I ask, like, well, who taught you that? Was it someone from the, the Virgin Islands? Or was it a book that was written by someone from Denmark or the United States or wherever the hell? And then, you know, you learned it that way. So, like, that's it. There's a huge thing there. Uh, of course, the islands are dependent on tourism uh, from the United States and everywhere. And a significant number of people come from Denmark and they want to, you know, experience the Virgin Islands. And so, like, that's another reason why it's so important for these places like the Estate Little Princess when tourists come to mm -hmm. see a different version that's coming from people from the island based on artifacts and documents. That's not saying that anyone's better or worse, just unveiling what actually, in fact, happened and what has been going on there for 300 years. So. Uh, you know, it's just a really interesting thing. And, you know, I'm not Danish. And I'm not uh, from the Caribbean. And like, you know, I'm from Idaho and I live in California and I've been doing archaeology on a lot of different sites and stuff. And so it's not strange for me to show up and see a community that's got two different versions of history going on. Uh, so that's not new. And my job of revealing this archaeology, you know, whatever data I've got is also not new. So it's up to the people who observes it to internalize what the, what suits them in their life. Uh, however, I do push people to think about whether that's causing harm to yourself or whether it's causing harm to others, right? So if, if you go to a place and, you know, it furthers your motivation to separate yourself from someone, there's something going on there, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's time to like really kind of internalize like what's going on in your own mind and how did your experience at this place engender those feelings and thoughts, right? Because, you know, we're, we're emotional beings and I get a different feeling when I go to a um, Confederate cemetery than I do when I go to a Union cemetery, right? That's part of who I am. And so there's many folks who get a different sentiment when they go to a place like a state little princess that talks about slavery and shows all this different stuff and then says, yeah, all these administrators were Danish citizens and they were the ones who were in charge of these many lives and these were human beings and then you go back home and, you know, folks are like, oh, well, it wasn't that bad. Well, you have been to Little Princess. Like you have seen what happened to Black lives. You go back to Denmark, you have a different perspective at that point of, you know, what you were told in school and what your museums tell you and like what other people say about the Danish West Indies. And so that's, you know, another motivator behind this work. I think that's a little bit off topic. How did mm -hmm. uh, St. Croix uh, fare during the hurricane, Hurricane Maria? Bad. Oh, right. it got, you know, that number, someone put there 41,000 people living on St. Croix. When I first started uh, going to work, uh, working on St. Croix, um, I, I want to say there was like 50,000. I'd have to look and see how many people. There was more than 100,000 people that lived in the entire territory and half of them lived on St. Croix. And as U.S. citizens, um, they're free to just leave. So once they could leave, they many of them went to the mainland. And it, you know, I, I can't remember how many schools, but I know that more than half of their schools were destroyed by the hurricane. 
And so students had to go to year round school, like one group of students went in the morning and then another group went in the afternoon all year because they didn't have enough schools. And it was only until like uh, 2020 or 2021 that they had enough schools for kids to go. Also, many of those people never came back. Like they went and found jobs on the mainland and they didn't move back to St. Croix. So the infrastructure got destroyed, internet gone, power in and out, water, sewer system damaged, and it took them years to fix it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it was horrible. We, one of the first things we did was evaluate historic properties on the island and record the hurricane damage. And the estate Little Princess was damaged greatly. Thank you. Mm-hmm. One person was curious about, um, were the sugar fields hampered by saline in- infiltration from the ocean? Was that part of the reason that they were struggling to kind of break even? Sure, that's uh-huh. that's a great question. And, uh, you know, not to get so deep into it, there's kind of like three main strategies of cultivating sugar. So first of all, sugar cultivation can really only happen where you can maintain that water, where you can maintain a field without the water all running off. So it has to be relatively flat. It's, you know, they didn't terrace the hills there to grow sugar because then how would you have gotten the 13, 15 foot long stalks of sugar down off these hills? You know, it's not the same as some of these other uh, grains, right? So having these flat areas that are in a situation where you can maintain the water, the soil moisture, at a more consistent time because rains only come at a certain time and on St. Croix. And then the rest of the time you have to kind of supplement it with irrigation and stuff in a place like the state of Little Princess. So the three main techniques are chop it all down, uh, burn off the, the, um, the waste, right? So as you crush all that cane stock, then you have all this extra kind of fibrous material. And a lot of that was used to actually power the burner. They put that dried cane stalk in there and burn it. Um, But those leaves in the other trash, you can burn that off on the field. But then that means that your field is exposed to the rains in the time when you're not growing cane and then erosion can happen, right? And you lose the topsoil. So then another way is to take all that trash and all those leaves and lay it down as kind of a layer of mulch that protects the soil until it's time to plant more cane. And then the third way is to just chop the cane off and leave the stump at the bottom. It's called ratooning. And then that stump will regenerate another thing of cane because grass is, uh, you know, sugar cane is a grass. However, you get with each round of ratooning, it doesn't have as much juice, right? So um, you'd have to have a whole lot of land or maybe you ratoon only part of your land, but that's the best thing for the soil. And what we think is that the combination of uh, burning and uh, you know leaving the trash and stuff eventually just kind of leached the soil because they, they didn't they weren't like in the off year planting other stuff to add nutrients to the soil. It's not like you know you all are in Iowa. It's not like the soybean corn you know dyad where some years you do corn and then to fix the soil a little bit better you do soybeans other years right so that you're not just draining your soil. This was like resource harvesting on an industrial scale and they and we think that they just harvested all the way the soils uh you know the the soil particles but also it just never was given a time to regenerate and and essentially it just became like less and less like you could grow less and less cane and it almost didn't matter how much water you had because there wasn't enough nutrients to get productive cane to grow there that's what we think happened at but that's our uh great scholar um Ben Siegel is going to do environmental uh, sampling of the soil in the areas that were cane fields. And then we'll have some information to see like what happens to soil after you grow cane on it for 200 and something years without a rest. That'll be really fascinating um, to, you, to learn you more guys about really, research. You all love this. If you think that dirt is fascinating, like you should be archaeologists. Come out. We're going out there. Come out there with us. We'll be out there. I got trials for y'all. Oh, I think I think there are more than a few of us who would be happy to get our hands dirty and learn a bit more. Uh, I see yes. our archivist raising her hand. Right. Okay. We'll see. Maybe we can organize a staff trip, staff adventure. I like it. Um, I, I'll ask one more question in the chat and then 
we'll let you get back to the rest of your day right. too. Um, so have you found any of the Arawak Indian pottery and artifacts? Um, and if so, how are they handled? Would those fall more under, um, would any of their cultural artifacts be handled a little differently because of that heritage? Yeah. Um, uh, so on the State Little Princess, we have not found ceram native ceramics. We have found um, pieces of stone that were used to make stone tools. We call them flakes. And we found very few. Our question is like, where the heck is all the prehistoric stuff? Because as I was saying before, we only live where we already have lived. The State Little Princess had to have been some kind of camp or some kind of like small village or a you know shellfish processing location or something i mean that whole area is rich with reef there would have been all kinds of fish available and all kinds of shellfish and we know that uh indigenous folk well not just indigenous folks folks create things like shellfish beds right they we stack the rocks so that it's more amenable for clam production and other kinds of shellfish right and, and also other kinds of reef fish so we know that humans uh, shape the seascape so that they can come back to these locations and use those resources. And like, if you, if I, if you zoom out on the state little princess on Google earth, you can see the reef is right there and it goes out, you know, hundreds of feet. So that would have been a sweet place to be. And we know that there's a small stream and a, and a um, spring there. So like, we just are not excavating in the right spot. I think, you know, we're focusing where we're at. We have our own research questions. We have not found ceramics that are associated with Arawak or Carib people. Uh, if we find them in these deposits, then we treat them like they're artifacts, right? And so, yeah, we, we're respectful. Um, but uh, to my knowledge, there's not like urns of human remains on the uh, St. Croix. If I'm wrong, you know, someone please tell me. But uh, their burials were in a different uh, orientation. And so uh, there's nothing to really tells me that like, you know, there would be burials or, or if, you know, I, I don't know enough to say if pieces of ceramic are part of their spiritual bundles that maybe we do need to treat them differently. Um, so we would just end up treating them like they were artifacts for better or for worse, because we don't know any better. Oh, how do you contact me? Send me an email. My email is at uh, Berkeley. Um. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. This has been wonderfully fascinating. And uh, this recording will be available later this month for anybody who wants to rewatch it um, and for anybody who is unable to join us this afternoon. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your week. Bye, everybody. Thanks.